Thank you, Fernando. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are on the on the earth uh, these uh, strange days. Yeah, many thanks. I will try to be even shorter. As you see, this is the third webinar, um, and uh, larger introductions uh, you will find then on the recordings of the previous webinars or on the website. So I will just briefly, for people who are new here and here the first time, um, about Refree Drive. So what is the project about? Um, Refree Drive is a um, is a Horizon 2020 uh, funded uh, project from the European Commission, 13 partners from different countries with different tasks in the design and manufacturing of the electrical motors, the power electronics, um, material specifications, and uh, we will also do an in-vehicle integration and testing under driving uh, cycle conditions. Um, our main goal is to avoid rare earth in the electrical traction uh, motor. And why should we avoid rare earth? Um, there's a high supply risk. Uh, so mainly uh, neodymium and dysprosium are very critical um, and have a, a high importance, not only in automotive, but also other industries um, towards the green uh, uh, transition. But they're always uh, concentrated and the supply is, um, uh, very much controlled. Uh, cost is an issue, definitely. Uh, so the, the cost portion here of the permanent magnets uh, within a uh, permanent magnet motor is quite significant. And if we go to other technologies, we avoid this, this green cost portion. Um, market vol volatility, price uh, peaks, etc., cetera, um, make supply even more difficult and OEMs or suppliers uh, have a hard time to deal with this. And um, uh, last but not least, environmental and LCA issues with uh, these um, uh, critical um, rare earth materials are uncertain. Our goal is to develop um, rare earth free traction technologies, um, but not in an, as an academic uh, exercise. We want to make sure industrial feasibility, mass production, and ultimately lower cost through clever material selections, um, not only copper, which is the main theme today, but also we looked into the electrical steels. We look onto the manufacturing process. So this is the, the main topic here today. So we'll see different uh, aspects of the manufacturing process related to the induction motor, uh, design optimization and scalability. Uh, beside the induction machine with copper rotor, and we have two variants, a fabricated and a die cast, we will hear later in the, in the respective presentations. Uh, we also develop uh, synchronous reluctance machines, one with uh, permanent magnets, but these are low cost ferrites, so no rare earth, and one is a pure synchronous reluctance machine. Not a topic today, but you can find in the first uh, webinar also an overview on these. And we have two use cases, 75 kilowatt, which will later then be integrated in an um, LCV, a light van vehicle on road testing, and a 200 kilowatt prototype physically built and tested extensively on test benches. So we will develop eight motors here in the project. Our target figures compared to state-of-the-art uh, motors, not permanent magnet motors. So we use the Tesla S60 induction motor as our uh, baseline, uh, but uh, it's, an, it's an interesting baseline, um, well-known and high volume on the market already. So uh, our goal is to increase torque by 30%. Uh, motor losses uh, reduced by 50%. So we're aiming for 96% um, motor efficiency, um, cost reduction by 15% in mass production, and the increase of power density by 50% as well. As I said, more information to find on our website. And we also have a uh, LinkedIn page together with two other um, projects here funded in the same cluster by the Commission. So I think we can go to the first speaker, Fernando. Yes, please. Um, so let's go ahead with Denise. Denise, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. So uh, my name is Denise Willems. I work at Aurubis in Belgium, which is um, a copper producing and recycling company. 
Uh, so our core business is the production of copper cathodes from concentrates and recycling materials. Uh, but we also use these cathodes to produce intermediate products like uh, cast wire rods, uh, copper shapes, rolled products, uh, bars and profiles. So today I will talk about the fabricated copper rotor uh, used in induction motors. So before we go into more detail on the production process of these copper components, I first want to talk about the choice of material. So because of the high temperatures induced in the electric motor during um, top speeds or peak performance, we want to make sure that the mechanical performance of our rotor bars can be ma maintained. So as you can see on this graph showing annealing curves, for pure copper and various copper silver alloys. You can see that pure copper will start to noticeably anneal or soften, meaning that it will lose its mechanical performance around 150 degrees Celsius. Now we know that at a top speed, uh, temperatures can exceed 150 degrees. Uh, they can even reach up to 180, 190 degrees. So that is the reason why we have foreseen a copper alloy instead of using pure copper for the fabricated rotor. So here you can see that addition of even very small amounts of silver. So typically we use around 0.04% up to 0.1%. Uh, and this will allow the, or this will increase the softening resistance of the material, um, allowing us to use it in the motors where temperatures can reach up to 200 degrees, thus allowing also for more freedom of operation. Now in Aurubis specialties, we cast copper wire rods in various diameters, which are then used to extrude and draw into a variety of bars and profiles. So when looking at the motor industry specifically, um, we are able to provide a, a wide range of profiles with varying levels of complexity. Um, so the dimensional range is shown in this overview graph here, where you can see that we can provide a large range of products. So going from the bottom left corner, the very small profiles for mainly automotive applications, up to the right uh, top corner, so the very the larger profiles, which can then be used for, for example, railway applications. Now, on top of that, um, we can not only provide these materials in pure copper, so this is an ETP or oxygen free. We can also provide this as copper alloys, with then copper silver being the most important one to mention here. Um, when we are then looking into the production of the copper parts for the electromotor, um, from start to finish, you can see that we go through a variety of production processes at Aurubis, even going back really to the start, starting from the raw materials, making the high purity copper, and from there making your copper parts. So we start at the beginning with our raw materials, which can be copper concentrates or recycling materials, which undergo a smelting and refining step to remove the impurities and then cast them into molds, uh, forming a copper anode, which is 99% uh, pure copper. This then goes to the next step where we do electro refining to give another purification. So from 99 to 99.9995% forming then the well-known copper cathodes. And these are then used to serve as a starting material for producing the copper products. So these copper cathodes are charged in a furnace and then cast upwards from the molten metal uh, directly into a 60 millimeter oxygen-free copper rod. And also in this step, uh, the required alloying elements can also be added to the melt to then produce the copper alloy rod. This as cast rod um, can then be used for extrusion for making the profiles. So um, it is decoiled and fed into a rotating extrusion wheel that pulls the wire rod in and pushes it through the extrusion die, thus plastically deforming the material and transforming the rod into the required profile that we want. Now, in order to achieve the final dimensions that we want, but most importantly, to achieve the mechanical properties that we want, 
we have an additional step where the profile is uh, called reduced by 30% by drawing it. So the product we have then, the only thing left is to um, cut the extruded and drawn bars into the required length, deburring them so that they are ready for assembly in the inner rotor. Then the second part of the process. So now we have our copper rotor bars. We still also need the end rings for making the inner rotor. So for fabricating the end rings, we again start from copper cathodes, which are uh, charred in a furnace and cast into a large mold of rectangular or round cross section. So here as well, uh, we are able to add alloying elements into the furnace to produce the copper alloy that we want. These large shapes can then be rolled down to a sheet from which then the end ring can be fabricated by punching. All the produced materials undergo the necessary quality control on both geometrical form, chemical composition, so in this case, the silver content, and then of course, the mechanical properties. So once we have all of our copper parts, we can continue on to the rotor assembly. So here we have the lamination stack will be uh, assembled with our rotor bars and the two end rings. Next, the needed connections are made by soldering. And then the only thing that is left is to add the shaft and the bearings to make it a fully assembled um, assembly ready for balancing to make sure the weight distribution is good and then giving our inner rotor ready as is. So to summarize, um, Aurubis is able to produce uh, a lot of copper components for motors. So we can produce bars of any required geometry and dimensions of a constant quality. And of course, also cut to the required length. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Denise, for your presentation. We can then move to David. David, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Fernando. My name is David Schmitz. I'm the technical director of Brockmann E-Mobility. And today I want to show you how we manufacture the high performance rotor with the high pressure die casting technology. So I will start with a short introduction, then I will show, the, show you the basics of the casting technology. Uh, it's important that you understand um, what is so special about our zero porosity casting technology. And then I will continue with the advantages of the ZPR rotor. So our company is uh, family owned, meanwhile in the third generation. And 2020 was a really exciting year um, with the takeover of, of Piat. It's now a member of the Brockman Group. And um, today our core competencies are the tool design and manufacturing, the die casting of uh, copper alloys above uh, 1000 degrees Celsius, um, the gravity die casting and also the high pressure die casting. And we offer also the CNC post-processing. So, but we want to speak about the induction machine, about the rotor. And here are two examples, one copper, one aluminum rotor. And you see uh, the rotor is, is uh, cut uh, to see the slots, the filled slots, because this is the main challenge uh, when casting the rotor, because the uh, melt, especially from copper, the melting point is nearly 1100 degrees uh, Celsius. So it uh, solidifies very fast. And when you have small slots and uh, also a high stack length, it's uh, even more challenging. So. Our milestones are from um, 2015. We casted for a German OEM uh, with a slot ground radius of uh, 0.6 millimeters. One year later, um, even 0.5 millimeters. And the latest uh, achievement is uh, American tier one company with a radius of uh, 0.38 millimeters at a stack length of 3.180 um, millimeters. So, and these milestones are uh, really, really important because we were worldwide the only company uh, who could cast these designs. And this is our goal. We want to give the motor designer the uh, freedom to design 
um, everything he wants. So get as much as conductive material into the rotor with many bars and uh, long slots, for example. And we do it with open and closed slots um, as well. So we offer you, uh, or we can offer you the complete rotor um, from the drawing to the, to the rotor, but our uh, in-house production is from the lamination delivery um, to the casted rotor. So we get the laminations, then uh, we can use loose laminations or um, interlocked or welded laminations. We stack it and fix it on a casting mandrel. Then we preheat the stacks because as I said, the, the melt would um, rapidly solidify and, uh, during the filling when we uh, don't preheat uh, the lamination stack because of the temperature delta. Um, then we put the preheated stack into the casting machine, cast, so it sounds easy. And if the process is stable, it, it is uh, really easy. Um, that's why high pressure die casting is the most efficient process uh, to manufacture um, rotors. And um, after that, we just have to remove our casting manual and have the cast rotor. So then um, our external partner uh, machine the rotor, insert the shaft and balance it so you can mount it in the motor. And what is important during the casting, here are some uh, key parameters like the melting temperature, as I said, copper nearly 1100 degrees, uh, tool temperature important for the solidification, belt treatment that you get um, the most of uh, mechanical and electrical properties. And um, for, from the casting side, the gating system, piston velocity and venting is really important to get um, a, a, a good uh, rotor. So here are some basics. Uh, I, I show you the horizontal die casting first. Here on the left side is the piston. Then we fill the metal into the filling chamber. And here in white is the, um, the cavity made from uh, two molds. So we pour the melt into the filling chamber up to a filling, filling level of about 50%. Uh, the other 50% is just air we have to remove. So the first phase is really slow just to remove the, the air um, until the melt is right underneath uh, the rotor, the in-gate. And um, then we switch to the second phase, uh, which is really fast. So the shot is, um, we call it a shot. So one filling is one shot. And uh, a shot is about 50 to 200 milliseconds, so really fast. So the second phase is the shot where we fill the complete cavity. It has to be fast that uh, we can fill these uh, small slots without solidification. And in the third phase, we uh, apply the intensification pressure to compensate uh, the shrinkage of the rotor, which happen during the um, um, uh, switch from uh, liquid to solid state and the de density change. And the first phase here is the most important one um, from the, for the horizontal die casting, because if the piston velocity and the filling level is uh, too slow, we get a jam wave and here is entrained air. And this entrained air cannot be removed and will be enclosed in the rotor later. So if the piston velocity is uh, too fast, we get an overshock wave and have also enclosed air and dirty melt. And you need the perfect filling level, the perfect piston velocity to push all the air out. And um, then you get good, um, good shots. And this is why the process is uh, quite unstable. And here I have a filling simulation. You see uh, here the uh, metal is um, at the uh, filling chamber, the, the shot sleeve. Then in transparent, here's the complete gating system and on the right, uh, the rotor. And you see the gating is getting smaller to the um, rotor because it's acting like a nozzle to uh, increase the speed of the, of the melt. But um, due to the size, it's just um, covering one or two slots and the slots um, between the end gates aren't covered. So we fill through um, one slot and that get, 
and then get a backfilling. And this is the problem. Here we have the, uh, the backfilling and this air here uh, cannot be removed. It's in the rotor and cause uh, high gas porosity. And in the worst case, it can cause um, um, broken, uh, broken bars. So we have no connection between the enterings and the bar. And here are some CT scans of the rotor. Here's a cross-section cut and the uh, longitudinal cut. And you see that we have uh, about 10% uh, porosity on both uh, pictures. And the maximum tolerance is about 5%. So it's um, right above. And um, here in the lower picture, you see that you have a mix of gas porosity on the outside. And also because the liquid um, solidify at last in the middle um, of the um, entering. And here you have shrinkage porosity. So it's a mix of shrinkage porosity and gas porosity. And the problem is you can never predict where the porosity will be. Um, so here underneath is uh, the slot. And right here, you have the highest mechanical stress on the rotor. And um, that's why you don't want to have uh, porosity in this area here. But with gas porosity, you cannot predict where the porosity will happen. What we did, you see it on the rotor, we just uh, turned the complete um, technology 90 degrees to a vertical die casting uh, machine. This machine is really big. It's uh, about eight meters high and especially made for rotor casting. And of course, I cannot show you here the complete gating system, but in the simulation, you see that we fill from the bottom we can um, push out the air completely to the top. And uh, do, um, because the air is completely pushed out, um, or, okay, I have to start uh, <laughs> um, other. We have a completely, we have a filling factor of the filling chamber of 100%. So we have no air in the filling chamber. The filling chamber is right underneath the rotor. So we, had short, we have short, um, distance. And then we uh, fill first the lower entering, then the slots. And we call it laminar filling because in the previous slide, you saw the um, turbulent spray filling. And this is laminar. And uh, we fill every slot at the same time. So this is why we can push out the air completely um, over the um, upper entering and have no enclosed air in the rotor. Also here we have one melt front and the melt front is always a little bit dirty because of the lubrication. And uh, we also can push out it um, to the overflow. And in the rotor just remains a good quality melt, uh, which ensures best mechanical and electrical properties. And uh, we also made CT scans of it. And you see here that we have uh, no porosity in the, in the rotor at all. So, and that's why we call it the zero porosity rotor. And if you ever get uh, some pictures of X-ray or CT scans, you uh, should ask for um, both sides because um, we call it site A where the in-gate is and the in-gate um, can, uh, the, the intensification pressure can last longer. So you have uh, less shrinkage porosity and this is uh, commonly the, the better side, but the B side is, is um, worse. And um, we achieved uh, now that we get both sides uh, ZPR quality, both with aluminum and copper. And the advantage of uh, the ZPR is uh, I have much more slides to this. Uh, we made uh, many anal analysis, but um, I'm running out of time. And um, the ZPR has superior mechanical characteristics. We uh, transferred the, uh, the porosity from the X-ray uh, into CID files and uh, made FEM analysis. And uh, the ZPR rotor lasts 12.5% uh, longer than the max RPM before um, bursting. And also the, the connectivity is uh, better because um, as I said, the, the dirty melt is on the overflow and not on the rotor. You don't have um, uh, gas in the rotor, so non-conductive material. So all material or um, the complete rotor is filled with conductive uh, material. And the la last one, and uh, meanwhile, the most important one is the process stability because um, many supplies are 
um, challenging uh, are um, are fighting against scrap rates of 10 to 30 percent and um, with our ramp up phase and the immobility um, this is not going to work anymore so we need pros um, constant processes um, which are not right at the edge of the tolerance because then uh, some temperatures winter or um, summer temperatures can affect the process that you um, uh, doesn't uh, that that you don't reach uh, the desired uh, quality and then you cannot deliver and the customer has no parts so that's that was our uh, main goal to make a robust uh, process with a good quality okay that's it from my side um, if you have any questions then let me know with the q a formula and i will um, give to to mario thank you Right, thank you, David. Indeed, uh, please send your questions to the Q&A bot. Uh, we will tackle all of them after the presentation series. So now um, the floor is yours, Mario. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Okay, thank you, Fernando. Uh, my name is Mario Petuschi. Uh, I am in Technomatic as uh, an electrical engineer. Technomatic uh, produces uh, automated production systems for uh, uh, the market of uh, automotive, uh, in particular uh, for the help in winding assembly systems. Technomatic exploits its large IP portfolio, which covers the main steps of the manufacturing process. So today I present uh, some aspects of the winding, uh, airpin winding uh, manufacturing and some uh, um, product to process uh, um, uh, design uh, constraints uh, for the winding, for the winding scheme. So uh, here uh, I outlined the manufacturing process of airpin winding and what airpin winding is. Starting from the cut to length, the segments of the wires are stripped and formed in the shape of the airpin that we can see on, uh, on, the, on the top left figure. Then a set of these airpins is assembled in a crown shape that is shown here. When all the slot liners are inserted into the stator stack and uh, they are splayed in order to ease the insertion of the, uh, of the winding, uh, the, 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 the set of the crowns that uh, are uh, constituting the, the winding are um, inserted actually in the, in the saddle slots uh, at once. So when uh, uh, the free hands uh, uh, protrude at the opposite side, they need to be bent one towards the other in order to close the electrical circuit of the winding. So uh, this process is called twisting. So the free ends are twisted one towards the other. And then when they, they are adjacent, they can be welded. And uh, after the welding process, quality checks can be performed. Now it is clear that uh, each conductor of a helping winding occupies a predetermined position in the wound stator. And the slot geometry is adapted on the wire dimensions. In round wire windings composed of random wound coils, the opposite happens. Therefore, the hairpin winding design strategy should be reversed. Hairpin winding and motor design should be held together and should consider manufacturability by mass production means at early design stage. And this was done in the refri drive project. The approach was adopted during the design of the induction motor for the refri drive held by the project partner Motor Design Limited maximizing motor performance by designing the state of lamination and the winding as a wall. Uh, after the winding specs review, the um, several different uh, winding schemes uh, and uh, correspondingly uh, winding and dimensions were proposed to the uh, motor designer. So uh, with this information, the motor designer 
could calculate the winding losses and verify proper matching of the insulation requirements. Uh, then on a subset of optimal uh, designs, a 3D modeling was uh, performed in order to enable the process uh, design and uh, cost evaluation so that uh, a target of performance and cost could, uh, could be achieved. So uh, in, 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 the, in the case of, uh, of the Refri Dry project, um, a four layer winding has been chosen. And uh, however different choices can be justified, still considering that the margin of efficiency improve, improvements drastically decreases with the increase of number of wires in the slot as shown on the right side figure. So there we see that uh, the curves of uh, uh, six, uh, four, six and eight layers per slot are uh, very close uh, uh, one each other up to the base speed of the induction model of the refri drive. So now let's go a uh, bit deeper on, uh, on the process. Uh, starting from the wire cut to length, uh, we have uh, uh, in this operation included the wire straightening, animal stripping at both ends of the segment and preparation of the free ends for welding and wire cut. These operations are performed automatically for all the length variants needed by the winding scheme. For example, in the bottom figure, we see uh, three variants of lengths per crown, one for standard, one for mid path, and the other for phase terminals. So we have uh, in this winding, that is the, the, the referee drive uh, winding, six uh, variants for length uh, of the entire winding. So let's uh, now the that the segment is cut, the wire moves to the airpin forming operation that is performed by different forming technologies according to the product specification and cycle time. In the refri drive project, because of the large uh, dimension of the, of the wire of the, of the airpin that spans 90 degrees for a four pole machine, uh, it was decided to proceed with the first planar bending of which the effect we can see on the left top figure, uh, just before uh, the application of circumferential bending by this the represented tool. And on the bottom side, uh, we see the uh, effect of this uh, tool uh, giving the circumferential bending to the airpin. However, uh, the bending operations can be separated or integrated and uh, uh, an integration uh, is uh, represented on the uh, right side picture on integration on, uh, on the automated line. So from the airpin forming, uh, the airpin goes to the assembly, uh, winding assembly operation. So when the, um, the basket that is represented in the left side pitch, picture uh, is a field with all the uh, proper uh, air pins. Uh, it uh, rotates in order to uh, let the hair pins to rotate in uh, on around the, their inner legs so that uh, the crown uh, gets the uh, annular shape that is represented in the in the center figure. So from here this is transferred to the dummy where or uh, previously uh, collected uh, crowns uh, are already present and where uh, the next crowns of the same winding are being collected. When all the crowns are collected there, the winding can trans be transferred for the insertion into the stator stack. After the insertion, the, the protruding uh, free hands have to be twisted. So, they are bent by means of the circular matrices of pockets, uh, each pocket being filled with uh, a single free hand. As shown in the bottom figure, counter rotating uh, uh, matrices move the free hands of adjacent layers, one towards the other. And in other fixtures, uh, the pockets can also be moved in the radial direction in order to widen 
the, the winding end as represented in the top right figure. So this widening is particularly needed to create this clearance between the welded pairs that uh, is uh, particularly needed for the optimal encapsulation by means of powder coating of the welded pairs. Then after the twisting, uh, the welding is applied, Technomatic uses and integrates uh, on its uh, automated lines, uh, trump sources for uh, laser welding. Uh, by using welding templates, uh, the welded pairs are accurately displaced and um, uh, the same welding templates protects, uh, protect the insulation coating of the underlying uh, layers. So after this, quality checks can uh, be performed in automated lines and uh, in our uh, prototype uh, department. So they, they, they pertain particularly uh, in vision inspection and uh, electrical uh, qualification. So let's go, if time still there is, um, let's go deeper in uh, the topics of the winding design. Winding and motor, as I said, should be designed as a, as a wall with manufacturability constraints. The winding scheme uh, is reviewed to reduce uh, the power uh, the process complexity and preserve motor efficiency and robustness. For example, uh, here in the left side picture, we see uh, multi-phase slots with non-grouped phase conductors where three phase-to-phase -phase separators are needed. On the right side picture, the phase wires are grouped in two groups so that only one phase-to-phase -phase separator is required in the slot. These two different design choices have some impact on the product, which has shorter winding end for the first choice and a higher filling factor for uh, the second choice. And also has a large impact in uh, the process, which is simplified on the twisting operation with the first choice and it simplified the in insulation uh, uh, slot liner insulation into the stator stack and winding insertion into the stator core um, for the second choice. Just another example um, that is usual to, to face when uh, uh, the, the, the motor designer um, needs to connect the, the the winding to the inverter, uh, it can decide to put the exits of the winding at uh, the welding side or twisted side, or it can decide to put uh, the exits at the insertion side. Uh, it is clear that uh, the left picture represents uh, uh, four regular uh, air pins, uh, Mm, and the, the right side picture represents three regular air pins plus two I pins. So the effect of moving the, the exits from the uh, twisting side to the insertion side is to having two uh, forms, uh, two forms to be formed more. So um, in spite of having a, a regular uh, distribution of the welded pairs, we have to balance it with uh, two uh, forms more for the um, for the air, for the forming station so uh, here also we have uh, uh, product features uh, shorter winding ends for the first choice and bus bar required for the second choice but from the process point of view we have minimum number of shape variants for the left side choice and simplification of the assembly process uh, and for the for the second choice we have simplification of the twisting process because as i said the the twist the, the welded pairs are evenly distributed and also simplification of the welded pairs and encapsulation process at the same side so the, this was just few two examples i didn't want to go deep uh, in the 
hot topic of the hairpin wine is that is the balance of paths because there are experts on this team that can uh, be indicated in these slides. Uh, in, in this field, there are many uh, other papers. And uh, just I outline in this slide uh, the, the main uh, um, features uh, from the product to the process that uh, are usually considered in uh, the winding review. So um, I uh, gave uh, an outline of the process in these uh, slides and uh, some uh, design criteria connected to the, to the process. In uh, this slide, you see the uh, winding of the referee drive uh, induction motor, uh, the airpin winding. So I thank you very much for the attention and uh, give the floor to Fernando again. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mario. Very interesting presentation as well. So, um,